So that's it. So the world is framed. Motivation set goals. You could say the world has to be framed. So motivation sets that frame. Crews goals, emotions, perceptions, and actions. And then actions track progress. So positive emotion says you're moving forward properly towards your goal. And if you encounter something you don't expect, you stop. That's anxiety. It's like, oh, we're not where we thought we were. And so we don't know what to do. So we should stop because we don't know where we are or what we're doing. Stop. Frozen. And then the more powerful negative emotions like pain, they might make you get out of there. So emotions, forward, stop, reverse. That's your emotions within that motivated frame. So, and that's another example of how your mind is embedded in your body. Your know, emotions are like they're, they're offshoots of action tendencies. That's, that's the right way to think about it. Because action is everything, fundamentally. So what are some basic motivations? Uh, most of these are regulated by the hypothalamus, by the way, and that, that tells you just how important a control system it is. The other thing that's useful to know about the hypothalamus is that it has projections going up from it that are like tree trunks, and inhibitory projections coming down that are like grape vines. So you can kind of control your hypothalamus as long as it's not on too much, but if it's on in any serious way, it's like, it, it wins. So partly what you do to stop yourself from falling under the dominion of your hypothalamus is to never ever be anywhere where its action is necessary right? you don't want to go into a biker bar because you might find yourself in a situation where panicked defensive aggression is immediately necessary you probably don't want that you don't want the panic, you don't want the terror you don't want the frenzied fight, you don't want any of that you don't want to have to run away in absolute panic so you just don't go there and, and a huge a huge part of how we regulate our emotions is just by never going anywhere where we have to experience them and so that has very little to do with internal inhibitory control and everything to do with staying where you belong so okay so basic motivations hunger thirst pain pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus that's a different circuit anger slash aggression thermal regulation panic and escape Affiliation and care, sexual desire, exploration, play, and you can kind of break those in. You can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories too, and say, well, there's a set of motivations that go along with self-maintenance. That'd be your survival, ingestive and defensive. See, I've sort of coded them there. So the the self-maintenance. There's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance. You say that's hunger, thirst. There's a set of defensive motivations. Pain, anger, thermal regulation, panic and escape. And then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction, affiliation, care, and sexual desire. And then I put exploration in place sort of outside of that. Uh, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally. So, what I tried to do is take the basic motivations and then nest them inside a fundamental Darwinian framework so that you could see how the biological process of evolution has manifested itself and then sort of differentiated into these fundamental, fundamental biological systems. So, okay, so this is a rat brain flat map. And so it's basically what you would see of a rat's brain if you flattened it out, unrolled it, flattened it out, and then made it two dimensional. And you can see here. So this is the hypothalamus And you can see that it's made out of these different nuclei, that's what they're called And they sort of correspond to those shapes that I showed you in the human hypothalamus earlier And you see that there's different systems, there's the system for eating and drinking is outlined in green And uh, the reproductive system, there's two of them, and they're outlined in, in I think it's red, is that right? Yeah, reproductive is red and the defensive ones are in magenta And so those are the, you could think about those as the three fundamental value systems of living creatures with complex nervous systems as far as the hypothalamus is concerned And then, given what I told you about the hypothalamus, which is You hardly need the rest of your brain at all As long as you have a hypothalamus, it's worth thinking that those are very fundamental to value per se Now. You might think, if you only need the damn hypothalamus, why bother with the rest of the brain at all? Which is, it, it, that's a very useful question Especially because most creatures don't have much of a brain So, but it seems to be something like 
Well, you've got your eating and drinking system, your reproductive system and your defensive system But the problem is, is that those things, first of all, can conflict You know, are you too hungry to sleep or too sleepy to eat? So that's a pretty simple kind of contradiction, you know Are you more angry at your partner or do you want sexual relations more? So there's, and so they can conflict in the present But then they can conflict with other people doing the same thing And they can conflict across time and so partly the reason that you need the rest of your brain is to solve the problems that emerge from the solutions that the hypothalamus offers And so because you don't want to just eat and drink and reproduce and, and, and defend yourself You want to eat now, later, tomorrow, next week and next month While you're able to engage in reproductive activity and defend yourself In multiple contexts with a whole bunch of people for as long as you can possibly manage it and so you need the rest of your brain to calculate that And so what the rest of your brain has to do, roughly speaking, is regulate these And also elaborate them up into like, like into something that's integrated inside you Which might roughly be your personality And then, so that that personality is integrated with the personality of other people And so you can think about it as an emergent process This is one of the things I really like about Piaget He's so damn smart, because Piaget is the only thinker I know, really who really addressed the problem of the evolution of value systems Like he never nailed it down to the physiology because there wasn't enough known about physiology when he did his work but it maps really nicely onto the physiology but you know he said well but he got it right anyways he said you come into the world with a handful of of uh, pre-established reflexes okay we're going to complicate that up a bit no you come into the world with a handful of micro personalities that are centered around these fundamental motivational axes, okay? And then that gets you started and, and that has motor output as well as perceptions and all of that that's associated with it And then, as you interact initially, let's say, with your mother You start to learn how to integrate those things in some sort of social context Because you form a relationship with your mother right off the bat And so, you're starting to figure out how to, to, to produce patterned and stable interactions between those motivational systems on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis and one of the things you do with kids, it's really important to do this with kids is you want to get them onto some, some sort of a routine because what the routine is actually is the beginnings of the system that integrates all of these underlying biological systems into some sort of unity because they, they have to sleep and wake up so you want to get nail that down so it's predictable you know, they have to eat, they have to stay warm, and they need to do that in a manner that's, that's stable And so, it's to your great benefit as a parent that you get islands of stability planted in the life of your kid So that some of this gets simplified, so that the kid isn't constantly preoccupied with domination by these different motivational systems And so it's a useful thing to know, because you might think, well, you don't want to impose any structure on your baby It's like, no, wrong you don't want to be a tyrant about it, but there's no difference between that structure and the emergence of the child's adaptation to the world And to some degree, what you're trying to do is free them up from arbitrary do domination by these underlying motivational systems You know, because if a baby gets too tired, it, it's, it's a horrible little thing, it'll just scream at you non-stop and it's not happy about it, it's like it's not good for anyone for that to happen And so the faster you have to do it in relationship with the child, you mean, some will sleep right away in a schedule almost immediately and other kids are harder to, to, to get their uh, circadian rhythms regulated so you have to attend to the individual differences that characterize the child but you're still trying to establish some stable harmony out of this mishmash of initial, of initial systems so alright, so, so that's sort of a physiological look at it, this is more of a conceptual look at it, so I said that each of these systems you can think about in a bunch of different ways you can think about it as something that sets a goal I'm, I'm hungry and I don't want to be hungry point A, point B so the hunger and the vision of the satiation of the hunger are all part of the same frame and so if you're hungry you go into the kitchen you know that already, that's part of your Procedural knowledge about how the world works and then what you're going to look for are only those things that are relevant to what you're trying to do in the kitchen 
Everything else is zeroed out, you won't even really see it, and why would you? You want to see the things that are relevant to the task at hand And so that, that's the thing that's so cool, I think, because what it means is that you see the things that are relevant to the task at hand And so here's something to think about Let's say that you see a whole bunch of things in the world that you don't want to see You know, that make you constantly miserable and unhappy w One thing you might ask yourself is, are you sure that your goals are proper? Because your goals determine what you see, now not a hundred percent, obviously You can be thinking about um, the homework you're going to do and step off a curb and be hit by a van It's like, you're going to get hit by the van regardless of how you've oriented your perceptions, likely, in all likelihood So I'm not trying to argue for pure solipsism, but it is very interesting to consider that since you see in relationship to what you want, that a very large amount of what you see is dependent on what you're aiming at and so one issue is, if your life is wretched and miserable, one thing to think about is whether or not what you're aiming at is the right thing to be aiming at it's a, and, it, it's, and nothing is exactly the wrong answer to that, I'm aiming at nothing, so okay, you're going to experience a tremendous amount of misery and not very much joy So anyways, you've got this little frame, you're somewhere, and it's not good enough, and you're going somewhere else that's going to be better And what better depends upon is the state of these underlying biological systems and then more complexly, as those biological systems get integrated into a personality and into the social world then the, f the frame and the goal is going to be dependent on that more complex hierarchical organization so you're not in here because you're hungry you're in here because if you get a degree, maybe you don't ever have to be hungry so, so the hunger is properly incorporated into your you don't want to be cold, you don't want to freeze to death in the winter, you don't want to be on the street you know, so your higher order goals are long term, socially negotiated solutions to the problems that are implicit in your being that, that might be one way of thinking about it so, so, and the micro elements of this, so you could say I'm hungry, that's a physiological state and a conception I have a vision of how I'm going to solve that, but then and those are, that's an abstraction But what you do to transform point A into point B is not an abstraction You act